waiting for. Good morning, everybody. Stand up and join us. Let's sing a song. Actually, it's Grace Greater Than Our Sin. It's page 344, and we will do verses 1, 3, and 4. Feel free to use your hymn book if you'd like to. Welcome to church this morning. I hope that you're doing good because I can see some bright and shiny faces and all the great smiles. And even if you're not smiling, that's okay. Uh, God is still good and, and I, I hope that there will be joy and peace and grace that you're looking for during the service that you can take home. Um, well, welcome to all those people that are watching online and watching the service at a later period of uh, time. Um, we pray that you will be blessed from wherever you're watching this. Welcome to our church, our, a commu community of love and grace. And we want to share this, this love and grace and the peace that God has given to you, to you and whoever you're in touch with this week. So um, I pray that, you know, God will continue to bless you during this week. God has put our church as a beacon of hope in the city, and as we continuing, continue doing our work each and every day in this beautiful city, uh, we do face challenges, and we do some great works in the midst, because there is no every day without challenges. But God still gives us the strength, just like how he has given you the strength to get up today and make a decision and come to church. And it's so great to see some good folk like Vern come to church uh, after uh, a wonderful, um, you know, miraculous time uh, with, with treatments and procedures in the hospital, so I'm seriously excited there. God is, uh, God is a good God, and so we thank, thank God for all that stuff. Um, so we're going to go into this service today and celebrate God in each and every part of the service. 
Welcome. As we uh, together do our responsive reading. <clears throat> Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Let us pray. God, our loving Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. We thank you because you are still God. God over everything. God over our fears. God over our troubles. God over our joy. God over our sorrows. God over everything. The biggest mountains that I can see, you're God over it. The infinite galaxies that I don't know about, you're still God over it. And we thank you for all that goodness that you have poured into our lives, Lord. And we thank you because you are our father, you are our mother, you are our everything for us. And we thank you because you're a good God. God, we remember your people at this time, all people that you created in your image. We pray that each and everybody will hear about your name, the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and will work with your spirit, the Holy Spirit that you have left for us, for each and everybody that, it, that calls upon you. Father, at this time, we pray for this community. We pray for the city. We pray for the people in the city and the, the state, this country, this world. We pray for all those who are being persecuted for your name's sake. I pray and remember all those things that are going on. Even at this time, we are praying northeastern India is burning because they call themselves Christian. They are stripped naked and, and gang-raped Murdered, over 400 churches burnt. Father, I pray for mercy and grace. I pray for the wickedness of those rulers there to stop. I pray that your kingdom will come, Lord. I pray that your will be done. You are a God who hears all cries, and I pray that you will hear their cry as we cry together with them. Father, I pray for all those people who are doing your works throughout the world. I pray that you will be with them as they take your word and your love to all people. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song, Like a River Glorious. I love this hymn. Let's sing all three verses of this hymn this morning, shall we? Like a river glorious. 
To our time of receiving the offering as a church family, I want to invite you all to join me in a word of prayer in just a moment. But before doing that, I would like to just express gratitude to all who volunteer and serve in different ways, who give your gifts um, through service. This past week in particular, we had a special ministry here. We had Vacation Bible School for the first time in several years. And I want to give a special thank to uh, Brother Moses and also to Pastor Sam, but especially Brother Moses, sorry Sam, uh, for really helping and really working with the kids and with the Child evangel Evangelism Fellowship people. It was a great experience, and the kids had a lot of fun, so thank you very much. Um, God is good, and today we have the opportunity to share our tithes and offerings, not only to support the ongoing work of our church, but also uh, to support uh, the needs around the world through one great hour of sharing uh, which is a world relief effort that is managed by various denominations, our American Baptist denomination being one of them. Uh, our sister in Christ, uh, Vicki, uh, will share about that in a bit. But if you have brought those offerings today, you're more than welcome to share them as the plate is passed. Shall we pray? Dear God, we are grateful again that we have the opportunity to be in your house, um, to be with your people, uh, to be together. Uh, with you and with one another. Lord, it is a blessing when your people are able to gather in this way. God, we worship all during the week through the way that we live our lives, sometimes imperfectly, sometimes better than others, Lord. But we are grateful that we have the opportunity to worship you through our work, through our day-to-day -day activities, and as we interact with other people. But God, there's something special about this moment when we come together in one place to worship as a family together. And so, God, one of the ways that we give you honor, that we give you thanks, is by providing this tithe, this offering, as the plates are passed. And Lord, however we give, whether through our time, whether through our finances, through our prayers, 
perhaps all of the above. God, may you bless both the gift and the giver as we seek to build your kingdom from this place in the city of Portland and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome you all again to First Baptist Church. Welcome those who are arriving and joining us just now. It's good to be together. Amen? And so why don't we take a moment and greet one another, say hello, shake a hand, give a high five. We're just glad to see you all with us today. Amen? <clears throat> And uh, it is so exciting to see what God is doing through this church. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, and um, it, is, it is such an exciting to, to be a Christian, yet uh, a very terrifying time uh, to be a Christian in this world. A lot of places are, you know, there's a lot of persecution going on as we, as we still enjoy our freedoms in this, in this country, thanks to the great people that fought for that freedom, but uh, so many places, uh, you know, you cannot worship like this, and uh, so I'm so grateful and glad that God has given us this place, this building in the city uh, where we can come, fellowship, love, eat, and uh, meet, and pray, and all that great stuff. So welcome to church. As we talk about eating, there's some really awesome food prepared downstairs for you. 
uh, make sure that you stay um, right after the service. We have some really good food. I, I, I tested a little bit before church, so, uh, and it is good. It is good. Uh, and so please, please stay because uh, we also have a, uh, our quarter meeting, our, our church quarterly business meeting going on um, that will be going on right after church. And lunch will be right there, so you can uh, have a business lunch. And um, like Pastor Matt mentioned, our VBS went on really great. I mean, I'm so excited that we had a VBS after many, many years in this church. Hallelujah. And uh, so, yeah, let's give God some really, th- you know, great thanks there. Because um, there was a lot of things going on and, you know, you know how the, the enemy wants to stop something that you want to do. So uh, a lot of discouragements um, when you want to start something. And uh, next year it will be even bigger. Okay? Uh, I think, and I, I was telling some of our, our, our church members, you know, if you know of any kids, please bring them. If you don't have any kids, have them. Uh, you know, just, just we want more kids in this church. You know, there's... There is, there is a great children's program, okay? Lisa's, Lisa, come on, there. Lisa is doing an awesome job, and, you know, she always sits back there so that, uh, you know, it's, it's, she is not very visible, but she is doing an amazing job with the children there, and um, we want to thank her for doing that, but we would love to have more children in this church. Invite them. There's a lot of children looking for things uh, to do because young person there, you know, youth uh, that you know of, they can participate in so many great things. They can, they can fellowship with one another, another youth. You know, today uh, in this polarized world, it's so hard to proclaim Jesus or even think that, you know, I love Jesus is, is a bad word today. Let them fellowship with other believers and know that they are not alone. We want to strengthen them. So tell, you know, spread the word and, and invite them. There are so many other things. You know, it's not just the church. We also go out for bowling. We go out, do other stuff. We have an awesome, uh, you know, unofficial youth minister, Leslie, who hosts some awesome youth parties at her place. And uh, I actually am suggesting that you make her uh, the youth minister there as well. And because the youth seem to love her. So there's so many things going on at our church. I am so excited because there is life coming back. You know, you know, I had so many of our members say, well, you know, Pastor Sam, our church used to have, um, you know, this used to be full and we used to open the doors. And, and my friends, God is going to do that again. All right? God is going to do that again. And I am telling you that we got to continue praying and working towards that. We got to continue praying. And, and not just to fill this place, but fill the city, fill this country, you know, so that we can be a beacon of hope to everybody. All right, so VB, uh, VBS is covered already. Now, PDX, together, together PDX is an event today in the afternoon. All fellow churches in Portland are joining together near the river, at the riverfront, not in the river. Um, they are gathering there near the river, in the riverfront, and they're going to celebrate and worship God together. That would be an awesome time. And if you, are, if you are available this afternoon, please go, because our church is a partner in that, and, and, and celebrate. See, see that it is not just, you know, the mess that you see in the city, but there's also that beauty in the city. You know, we can, we can do some great things together with other churches as well. PDX Worship Jam is coming up on the 29th of uh, this month. Uh, where, you know, it's, it'll be at Cedar Hills this, this term, uh, but there'll be some real good jam session. You know, they do some rock and roll and all that kind of stuff, but for Jesus. And, uh, but they're doing it there at Cedar Hills this, uh, this time, and if you would love to hear some of those and celebrate and worship together, uh, that is the time. We also have our picnic in the park. It is an exciting theme. The, the, the theme is picnic in the park and just to have fun. That's the theme. Okay? And if you have not signed up, please sign up. Uh, we have sign-up sheets available on the uh, welcome desk there. Uh, and the sign-up sheets looks something like this. I know that you cannot see it very well, but 
just go to the welcome desk. You'll find sign-up sheets. If you have not done so, put your name, your phone number, number of people uh, going to be attending, and if you need ride tickets. Now, there is no fee for anybody attending from our church or any of our fellow uh, you know, churches that we have invited. There is no fee. But there is a $5 parking fee that Oaks Park has come up with this year. Uh, and this is new. This is new. Um, so if you go to the picnic, be aware that, you know, keep some change, $5, for the parking. But we will also be having some rides um, from the church that will be going to the park um, on that day. We uh, have options for the ride tickets, but the ride tickets are uh, $30 per piece. And, you know, you can sign up on the sheet and we will call you or, you know, you can leave a check with uh, Jason uh, in the office or with Darsha. You know, you can talk to Darsha uh, or Leslie uh, can help you on how to do all those things. If you are uh, a, a vegetarian option, uh, if there is a vegetarian option available, you know, we will take that. You know, we will make it available for you. We just need to know if you are one. And so we can make that option available for you. Uh, I am not going to preach here, but um, last thing, <clears throat> one great hour, the giving, one eight great hour uh, is, is an awesome time. I know that Vicky is going to come right now. Um, uh, Vicky, wherever you are, welcome to the stage. She will uh, tell you more about this, but this is an awesome time to give. And if you have missed um, giving, you can use this envelope and then, you know, put the offering in the box that is right there at the, the entrance there uh, behind the pews. Wiki? So I'm here to share a little bit about uh, the one great hour of sharing offering uh, that we, our church has done, you know, for a number of years. Um, the theme verse this year is Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So this month, as you, I'm sure, are well aware, uh, several Sundays we've, we've had people talking about one great hour of sharing, and you probably noticed these nice envelopes in the pews. Um, this month, FBC is joining American Baptist churches and other churches across the, the country to give this offering. The funds are used across the U.S. and throughout the world to meet physical needs like feeding people, uh, growing food, mentoring kids, and also meeting their spiritual needs. Uh, for example, this offering is funding aid to Ukraine right now in the form of food, uh, generators for energy, uh, and uh, and the, to the churches there, uh, they're seeing growth in churches in Ukraine, if you can believe it, in the midst of all of that. Um, in the U.S., urban ministries to needy kids, after school and mentoring programs and stuff during the summer, of course. Um, community gardens, people growing their own food to help, you know, help with the, the food shortage. Um, and also funds are going for weather incidents, you know, flooding, um, typhoon, not typhoons, that's in the Far East, uh, hurricanes, that kind of thing. Um, I don't believe at this time we've <clears throat> shown any videos uh, in the church, but if you're interested in what, this, what these funds actually will be doing um, and are currently doing, uh, go to the website. It's right on the envelope, if you take the envelope, um, and there are videos about what what the money goes to, um, and what, you know, the ways that even your small gift can help. So if you feel led, I know that today's offering has already been taken, um, but there are, you can give next week. Um, there's an offering box in the back. You can do it online also. Uh, if you feel led to give, please do so, designating it to one great hour of sharing. Um, even a small gift can be pulled together to make gifts to make a big difference in the world. If you think, well, you know, my five bucks or my 10 bucks, what's that gonna do? Well, if you pool all those together, there are people on the ground that this goes to, and so even that small gift can make a big difference. 
So thank you, everyone, and please give. Let's be, you know, I just, I'm really grateful to Vicki and also the other members of our missions team. That's one of seven teams that we have here at the church uh, who does ministry in different areas. And by the way, if you're looking to get involved um, in volunteering and serving in different ways, uh, there are different opportunities in those teams. I'd love to talk with you, or Pastor Sam would love to talk with you about that. Uh, but they advocate for these different missions opportunities. And, and as a pastor, I'm often approached by people, oh my gosh, I heard about this terrible hurricane in country X or this uh, horrible forest fire that happened, et cetera. W what can I do? Well, one great hour sharing is, is the thing, and, and it is a trusted uh, mechanism that we have um, as, as uh, American Baptists to help around the world. I uh, want to uh, thank you all for being here today, especially the kids. They just reminded me that it is time for Kid Church. And so if there are any other kids out there, or if you see any um, that uh, trickle in here in a minute, feel free uh, to invite them to the Kid Church room downstairs uh, where they have their programming. I'd like to invite you to turn in your scripture today to the book of Genesis, chapter 42, and we are going to read the entire chapter. So um, hang out with me. It's, a, it's an interesting narrative. There's a lot going on here and um, it's kind of like reading a story it's learning about something that happened a long time ago and we're going to talk about how that relates to our lives today again genesis 42 verse 1 and i am reading as usual in the english standard version when jacob learned that there was grain for sale in egypt he said to his sons why do you look at one another and he said behold I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, You are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. 
So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and, shall, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack, and when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you today for the opportunity that we have, again, to be together and to gather to hear this narrative, this segment of the life story of a person who lived so long ago, of a family that lived so long ago and really that is still with us. And so God, we pray that you would help us to learn, help us to reflect as we think about what happens in Genesis 42. May we think of it not only as interesting historic information, but may we think of the way in which it points us to your son, Jesus Christ. May we think about the way in which it points us toward your grace. How we can receive from you that which we do not deserve. Forgiveness newness of life, salvation. Much like the brothers of Joseph received not only grain, but everything they brought to try to purchase what they needed to survive. Speak to us now, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, about eight years ago, my wife Lisa expressed to me what she wanted for her birthday, and she didn't want diamond earrings. She didn't want a shopping spree at the mall. No. Instead, Lisa wanted to go deeper, literally. She wanted to wander among the dark, crumbling caves under the city of Portland, where, legend has it, men were shanghaied, abducted from the saloons and boarding houses, and secretly transferred underground through the seawall along the Willamette River into the cargo hold of vessels in need of sailors 
not far from here at all. As the story goes, and some of you have heard about this, and perhaps many of you have, but as the story goes, they would wake up as forced laborers aboard some sailing vessel out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The very next day, for all they knew, they might end up in Shanghai, China. Hence the expression, getting shanghaied in Portland. You see, these days, Portland has its challenges. But a century ago, those challenges were far different in nature. To envision it, you have got to think of the most recent Western movies that you have seen, if you have watched a Western any time in the recent past. You've got to think of all the seedy activities that took place in those small towns in the Old West. Well, Portland had all of that going on, but... It was a larger city, so it was going on in vast quantities. And being that it had a busy port and a hopping shipping and timber industry, it was full of what you might call salty old sea dogs, lumberjacks, unscrupulous folks of various kinds. And although First Baptist Church of Portland was already around during that time historically, these were not exactly the type of guys that won awards for their Sunday school attendance. Well, in those turbulent days of the late 1800s and early 1900s, this phenomenon of shanghaiing really did happen. But according to the underground tour that I took Lisa on for her birthday eight years ago, it is doubtful to what degree the subterranean tunnels were actually used to make it happen. The correct term here is called crimping. Everybody say crimping. Crimping. And instead of happening under the city, under cover of darkness, crimping happened in broad daylight. Here's how it would work. Some of these crimps, as they were called, were also the owners of the boarding houses. Men would arrive in Portland without any money, and so the crimps would loan them money out of the goodness of their hearts to let them have a place to stay, to let them have some food to eat and perhaps something to drink as well. They may loan them about $2, which was a good deal of money back in those days, in the late 1800s. They just had to pay it back, of course. The crimp would have had the man sign a contract which he was most likely unable to read because most of them were illiterate. And you know what? the crimp had a tendency to forget to mention that if the man did not pay back his loan, he would have to work it off aboard a merchant ship for at least a year. That's pretty convenient, isn't it? For his services, the crimp might get as much as $50 in what was called blood money for each sailor he provided to any given sea captain. Well, Surrounded by all the temptations to be found in an old west city like old Portland, of course the victim would end up running out of credit and wouldn't be able to pay it back. So what would happen? Well, he had to go out to sea. There was no other choice for him. He had signed a contract. It all amounted to involuntary servitude. Human trafficking, really. Crimping was a corrupt and lucrative business with some crimps making as much as up to $260,000 a year in today's dollars. Well, on our tour, Lisa and I learned the story of one very wealthy crimper slash boarding house and saloon owner, and his name was Jim Turk. Jim was a real piece of work, you might say. He was a slumlord who had a reputation for doing anything for a fast buck no matter what the consequences might be for other people. He sent many a man out on his cruise on the Pacific Ocean. There is even a story told here in Portland about what Turk did to one of his two sons. As the story goes, the son angered Turk, and what do you think Turk did about it? Well, always the savvy crimp. Daddy handed his son over to a sea captain for an all-expense paid sea voyage around the world. Turk was a brawny scallywag. He was tough. He was well known for his bad temper, his proclivity toward violence, and as the saying goes, 
like father, like son. Perhaps they were just two alike. Well, wouldn't you know that one day, Sonny Boy returned to Portland. And how do you think the reunion with his father turned out? Did he beat him up? Did he do him in? Did he send his own father on an ocean cruise of his own? He was at a crossroads, wasn't he? What would he do? Well, as the story goes, the son walked in the front door of Daddy's saloon, walked up to his father, and, wait for it, he thanked him for sending him out to sea, for helping him to grow up. Not only that, but he ended up working with Turk and helping him in the notorious family business. Well, as we step back into the book of Genesis at chapter 42, we run into another son who was also at a crossroads with regard to members of his own family, carrying with him the sore memories of what they had done to him. What was his name? Joseph, of course. However, unlike the son of the Portland crimper, Jim Turk, Joseph was not a shady character. He in no way deserved the terrible treatment perpetrated on him by his jealous brothers. And so now, as, as the world literally came before Joseph's feet, would this mean that his own family would also come before him? That those brothers had, who had crimped him off to wandering merchants all those years ago, what would happen in this situation? How would he treat his brothers? Would he seek revenge? Would he use his well-deserved position of power and authority in this foreign country to justly punish them for their sins? Or would he seek reconciliation with them? Would he welcome them with open arms? The answer to these questions and more we will be exploring over the next several weeks. But the key point of it all today is this. God's grace is evident when it seems least deserved. Let's say that together. God's grace is evident even when it seems least deserved. In this passage, we really see God's good plan unfolding in many ways despite the treachery of human beings, including those that would do things like what happened in Portland so long ago including all the terrible things that happened in the Old West, if you really think about it, to various groups of people, which we can talk about at another time. God's good plan was unfolding in those days. And the first thing we see that happens is, number one, that the great famine hit home in Canaan. Just as Joseph had predicted, the famine affected more than just Egypt. It forced scores of people from other lands, including Canaan, to travel to Egypt to purchase grain. And as we learned last time, this made Egypt a very important place. It made Joseph a very important and powerful person because he was in charge of the resource which was more valuable than anything else. It doesn't matter if you're starving to death if somebody has a mountain of gold, all that matters to you is a mountain of grain. Amen? You want food. Because of God's providence and Joseph's careful planning, which was gifted by God to Joseph, by the way, he was the only person who stood between these folks and starvation. And so Jacob sent Joseph's ten, how many? Ten half-brothers to Egypt. These were the sons of Leah, to secure some of this precious, priceless grain and save the family. He did not send Benjamin, Joseph's only full brother, because he believed that Benjamin was all that remained from his beloved wife, Rachel. Remember, Jacob had two wives, and that's a whole other story, right? She died years before. And so the ten half-brothers get in line with the countless other people from various places at this great ancient grocery store, not known as Safeway or Fred Meyer, but known as Egypt. And they're in line. They're waiting to get their food. God's good plan continued to unfold when, number two, 
Joseph's brothers came to him for life-giving food. They really came before him, and they didn't know it was him, right? But they came there for salvation, to preserve their family in the face of starvation that was certain. And they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. They were humbled. Does this sound familiar? Well, it certainly would have seemed familiar to Joseph, who would have immediately recognized this as fulfillment of the very first dream God had given him back when he was a teenager, when his brother's sheaves of grain, do you remember? When they bowed down to his, it was the dream that began to anger them so much that it set in motion an unforgettable chain of events. But there was a problem. So far, only the first dream was being fulfilled. There was a second dream. Do you remember that? What about the second dream? You might remember that one, in which the stars represented Joseph's brothers back in Genesis 37. The sun and the moon represented his parents. Where were his parents? And where was his only half-brother Benjamin? Was his father still alive even? Joseph wouldn't have known. Why was only one dream being fulfilled? Well, to find out, Joseph set in motion a plan to answer that question with his brothers. This is why he spoke to them so harshly. Did you pick up on that? He called them spies no less than four times. Joseph knew that they were not spies. He recognized them. But not surprisingly, they did not recognize him. Think about how different Joseph would have looked since he was a teenager. They had been adults when they did their dastardly deeds. But he was still a teenager, and so he would have grown up. He would have looked differently. Not only that, but he's this high-ranking Egyptian official. He looks far different from his brothers. And to make himself even more difficult to recognize, did you catch what he did? He hid his identity from them by speaking to them through what? An interpreter. He really had them fooled. But even when he got the truth out of them that his father Jacob was still alive and that his brother Benjamin was with the father as well, that was not enough for Joseph. And this was only natural. Just imagine how much you would miss your closest family members if you hadn't seen them for 20 years. How many of you have been separated from loved ones for a long time before? That's rough. But 20 years? That's a really long time. Well, this wasn't about Joseph's plan only because God's good plan continued to unfold when, number three, Joseph's brothers returned home with life-giving food. And this is interesting because in an unexpected act of grace, according to verse 25, if you look at it, Joseph ordered the Egyptians not only to fill his brother's bags with grain, which is really all they were after, but he also gave them provisions for the trip home and ordered them to hide their money in the bags of grain, effectively making the life-giving food, listen to this, a true gift of grace. In other words, they ended up paying what? Nothing, nada, zip, absolutely nothing for this grain. This last part was something, though, that they did not discover until they were way down the road. You see, Joseph's harshness toward them was just an act. Joseph was actually deeply moved, wasn't he, by the sight of his brothers after so many years, so much so that it says in verse 24 that he turned away from them and did what? He wept. He cried. Amen? But instead of rejoicing over the fact when the first of them discovered it, you'd think they'd be excited. Oh my gosh, look at all this money that I have, right? What does verse 28 say? It says that their hearts sank. They turned, trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Can you imagine? That's called looking a gift horse in the mouth, isn't it? I mean, they were suspicious. They were incredibly concerned. They were fully aware also of how undeserving they were of this unexpected blessing. And so they didn't see it for what it was, a gift. Instead, they were suspicious. Instead, they were worried. And what does Jesus say about worry, by the way? Don't do it, right? 
They were worried that this was a sign that God was punishing them for their past sins. In a way, God was forcing them to experience the just consequences of their sins, wasn't he? Because in order to keep their lie hidden for all that time, they could do very little to console their elderly father when he said those painful words to them in verse 36. He said, you, my sons, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, because remember, he was back in Egypt. And you would take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Talk about rubbing salt into the wound, right? And yet, despite the apparent tragedy of Jacob and Joseph's brothers, God's grace was evident. How so? Quite simply, they were eating. They had food now. And God had used Joseph to provide it to them. Sometimes we just have to take the blessing and enjoy it when it's there, especially when it's a very serious situation like this. And, and we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. But despite the sins of Joseph's brothers, God had graciously provided for them and saved their lives. And isn't that the sort of thing that God does all the time? Isn't it? How does this relate to us? What is the life application for us today? Well, first of all, there's three today. First one is this. Honesty really is the best policy. Amen? Honesty really is the best policy. For 20 years, Joseph's brothers had been living a lie, a really big lie. They had successfully convinced their father that Joseph was dead and that it was not their fault. But as happens so often when people lie, the lie led to a long-term cover-up. Not only that, but it was followed by years. Think about it, years of agonizing guilt only made worse when, unbeknownst to them, they ended up in the presence of the one against whom they had sinned so gravely. I wonder, are you aware of a situation in your own life, in your own family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood? Are you aware of a situation in which a lie tore people apart. A lie caused years and years of agonizing guilt and pain. Thinking back, do you see how facing the truth way back then might have alleviated some of this pain? It may sound obvious, but at the end of the day, honesty really is the best policy. Secondly, don't be surprised when you get what you give. Amen? Don't be surprised. If you're rotten, if you do terrible things, don't be surprised if that comes back to haunt you later. This is a common theme, by the way, in Judaism. It is a common theme in pretty much every other world religion and belief system on the globe. It's popular these days in Western culture to borrow the ancient Hindu term and refer to it as karma, right? You get what you give, or you get what you deserve. That's another way of saying it, right? And it really is true to a degree. In the Sermon on the Mount, you can write down Matthew 7 if you'd like to. In the Sermon on the Mount, right at the beginning of Matthew 7, Jesus himself said this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. And the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6, 7 through 10, very sobering words, A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. All people, not just the ones we like, right? Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Amen? That's its own sermon, right? Should we be surprised that Joseph's brothers 
and this is an important question, very important, pay attention, should we be surprised that Joseph's brothers seemed to be getting their just desserts for what they had done to him years prior? No, absolutely not. Let me ask it to you this way. Put it in today's terms. Should you be surprised when today's drunk driver ends up dead in a car wreck? No. Should you be surprised when the abusive spouse ends up alone, despised, and left to fend for him or herself? No. Should you be surprised when the mean kid at school grows up to be alone and without any friends later in life? No. Should you be surprised when the modern criminal finally gets caught and thrown into prison? Absolutely not. Why? Because you reap what you sow. You get what you give or deserve. That's right, Emmanuel. That is just quite simply the way life generally works. The word generally is important there. That's the way it works. Everybody knows this. It should go without saying. It's foundational to pretty much every worldview out there. Christianity is certainly aware of this idea of cosmic or divine justice. If you read the book of Proverbs, and I invite you to do so, biblical wisdom makes plain these very ideas. And yet what makes the God of the Bible unique is that in addition to justice, God offers something very special. And that is this thing called grace. Everybody say grace. Thank God for grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Amen? Oh, man, I'm so glad karma is... I'm so glad that living by works alone is... Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. If justice is getting what you deserve, then grace is getting what you don't deserve. Amen? That brings us to our third and final application point today, which is also the key point of our entire passage. And that is that God's grace is evident even when it is least deserved. Today's passage, specifically verse 21, shows us that the brothers had been suffering with guilt. Even after 20 years, they hadn't forgotten what they did. In their own words, they had seen with their own eyes the distress of Joseph's soul when he lay there in the pit all those years ago, and yet they did what? Nothing. Brother Reuben pointed out that their current situation was God's way of punishing them, giving them a reckoning for Joseph's blood, verse 22. And yet what they saw as God's punishment was really God's way of salvation for them, of literally saving their lives by providing for them the material things in that day necessary for them to survive in a harsh world during the harshest of times. And it was not just God who was treating them with grace. Joseph, their brother, was in effect partnering with God by being the conduit of God's grace. After all, it was Joseph who chose to bless these men who least deserved blessing. It was Joseph who not only sold them the grain necessary when they had sold him into slavery effectively, it was Joseph who chose to save their lives and who on top of that also heaped on that another blessing by secretly giving them their money back. It was a pure example of grace. Joseph did not take any money for that grain. No, he ended up giving it to them as a gift. My goodness, if we could learn from Joseph, amen? And in turn, if we could learn from the Lord God Almighty. Of course, they ended up looking the gift horse in the mouth, as the saying goes. Knowing how wicked, and there's no other word for it, knowing how wicked they had been and how little they really deserved any sort of blessing at all, Instead of rejoicing over the blessing, the text says that they were dismayed, verse 35. They knew that there is no such thing as a free lunch, and so they figured this blessing would really end up biting them in the behind later on. Seems to 
people to be nothing more than foolishness from a worldly perspective. But as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, is to think about all the horrible stuff, that stuff you're ashamed to even think about right now, that stuff that you don't want to talk to anybody about, that you've done over the course of your life. I mean, shouldn't you have to do something to make up for all that? But the problem is you can never, everybody say, never. You can never do enough to make up for it. And even if you try, you'll still feel as guilty as Joseph's brothers did when they were forced to remember their past sins. I'm sure they had nightmares about their brother hollering from the bottom of that pit. Can you imagine? Like them, there is nothing you can ever do to make up for the past. There's no time machine. Back to the Future was a fantasy movie, folks. And so there is a need for grace. Amen? There is nothing you can do to cover your own sins. But praise be to God for grace. Grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Romans 5, 6 through 8 puts it this way. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man or person, though for a good man, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, before we had figured it out, before we even knew anything at all, while we were still sinners, Christ in that moment died for us. God's grace is evident, even when it seems least deserved. At this time, I'd like to invite the musicians to join me on the platform. As we reflect on God's amazing grace today, I want to challenge us all to think about ways we have experienced grace in our lives. To do that, I want to invite you to do something a little different. I want to invite you to close your eyes. Just close your eyes with me for a moment. We're going to pray in a moment, but with our eyes closed, as we prepare our hearts to talk with God in prayer, I want you to take a moment to reflect on grace. Think of an instance when you were the recipient of the grace of other people. When did somebody else bless you? When did they do something kind for you? When you didn't necessarily deserve it, what was that person's name? Do you remember their name? What, what did their face look like? What were the circumstances? What do you think motivated that person to act towards you in such a grace-filled manner? How did it make you feel to the, be the recipient of grace? How might God be calling you to extend grace to other people, especially to those who do not deserve it? With our eyes closed, if you're able to do so, I want you to think of a moment. The moment in which you first received God's grace, that moment when you were born again, when you trusted in Jesus for the very first time, if you can remember it, if you can pinpoint it, when you accepted the free gift of salvation available on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross, what brought you to that place? What made you so keenly aware of how little you deserved God's grace? But at the same time, how did it make you feel that despite all of your mistakes and failures, God's amazing grace saved a wretch like you just like it saved a wretch like me. Now, if you're not able to pinpoint that moment when you first received God's grace, well, then I ask you, are you ready to receive it today? To accept the free gift of salvation which is kind of like all that money that was heaped into those sacks on top of all the grain. It, it's a gift. It's something you can do nothing to earn. You can't buy it. You can't do anything for it. But I invite you to accept that gift by simply believing in Jesus for eternal life. He's the example, the ultimate example of grace. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for those times we have been the recipients of the grace of other people receiving a blessing when we did not necessarily deserve it. God, we give thanks for being recipients of your grace, which is ultimately revealed in the gift of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. God, like Joseph's brothers, 
we deserved nothing. In fact, truth be told, we deserved punishment for our sins. And yet, instead of reaping what we've sowed, instead of getting what we deserve, we are offered a gift, the gift of salvation, eternal life, something good from God in exchange for something bad in our lives. Lord, your grace really is evident when it seems least deserved. My friends, with our eyes closed, if you today need to talk about this grace, if you know that you are ready to be a recipient of God's love, of God's grace, if you finally understand that You are welcome in the presence of God, not because of anything you've done or could do, but because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Then I'll invite you in just a moment as we continue in our response of worship. Come forward. Won't you come? Talk with Pastor Sam. Talk with Pastor Anthony as we continue in worship, as we respond to this amazing grace in worship and song. Dear God, thank you for this moment. And thank you for these people whom you love so much that you died for them. Amen. And so I invite you, if you must go, if you have things happening in your day, you're welcome to go at this time. But if you need to receive God's grace, if you just need to pray, if you need to express some commitment to God, then I invite you to join Pastor Anthony up here in the front. Let's pray. Uh, let's uh, sing together, though, shall we? Unravel me with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave. I am a 
a song that you learned with us a little while ago, a declaration of our faith. This I believe. It's the whole ball of wax. It is.
Jesus. I was coming out of the 